Online Conference. I'm Alan Levine. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, actually, I'm in Vermont on a beautiful, sort of beautiful, rainy day to talk about stories. Always about stories. So, you know, some people collect rare stamps. I collected coins as a kid. Might be antique dolls. Might be, you know, jewelry from strange places, music, minerals, baseball cards. I think you get it. Me? I collect shiny little nuggets of serendipity. Examples of the unexpected gains when you give away ideas and things you made to people on the internet that you don't even know without expectation of anything in return. I want to believe that these are not rare. Sometimes I wonder why they're hard to find. But this whole thing comes from my own experiences on the internet since the late 1980s. I won't tell the whole story, but the one that really kicked it off for me Maybe I'm telling the whole story. The one that kicked it off for me was doing a presentation in Australia, kind of about this very subject. Showing an example from something in Flickr, how some stranger commented on my flowers. And that was pretty cool. But then this hand went up in the back of the room, and the woman said, that was me. Like, the odds of that were incredible. They were insane. Like, my heart stopped. And so that said to me, like, this stuff happens. And it maybe happens more than we pay attention to. Or maybe we don't, like, celebrate enough. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my own fascination habit. You know, people do have kind of weird collection things. These stories, amazing, true, whatever I call them, they're not going to change the world. They're not going to fix education. It's not going to make it easier for you to teach. It's not going to invigorate some new magical formula into what you do. But, you know, these times now, we have so much we're worrying about. We've got privacy. We've got the impact of what this engagement is. We've got the whole technology thing. And even around us, outside of school, there's things going on in society that makes it seem like, are things breaking down? And so, you know what? Honestly, these stories give me hope. And I hope that you get some hope out of this. So I really started collecting them as amazing stories for a presentation at the 2009 Open Education Conference in Vancouver. And I've done several iterations since then. And you can find them all on my own website. And if the video editors do it right, there's a URL right down there. And it'll be on the conference materials afterward. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to introduce them to you. I'm not going to play all the stories. i got 25 new ones. That's pretty cool. That I've collected just for the K-12 online conference. And, you know, I made a pitch for this from one of my favorite local metaphoric viewpoints in Arizona. It's quite an expansive view. And really what you're looking at, without too much of a geography lesson, is the edge of the Colorado Plateau. So you're looking at coming off of what's a stable, reliable platform that drops off into this great depth of unknown, mystery, wide open. And there are things down there that you can't really know from up here until you venture down there. And some of the paths are hard, some of them are easy, some of them you won't find anything, some of them you'll find magical things, but you really don't know from standing out there. So think of it as a metaphor if you're not there already. Come on, let's sit down and talk a bit. So what I'm going to do in this keynote, I'm going to just introduce you the stories and play a little bit of excerpts of what I think are the important points. You'll find different ones, or maybe not. But I'll leave the full watching to you. Uh, but they are really worth the time to look at and maybe to think about and say, hey, maybe that happened to me. Somewhere in the middle, I might muse or mutter about why they seem hard to find. Um, and then I'm going to ask you, I'm talking to you, uh, participants in this online conference, as you go through this experience of meeting and connecting online, to share back some stories with me, with this site, of what kind of ordinary or maybe amazing stories happen that just were kind of instigated during this conference. And even if you don't, well, I just hope you have some fun. So with that, let's get to the first story. And here we go. Someone who probably talks more about sharing than me is Dean Shiresky. And if you're in education, especially K-12, you're probably hard-pressed uh, to be in Twitter and not come across uh, things that Dean has shared as well as some of his silly things, his pants, his jumping up and down, his naps. And he uses this, his own silliness, as a way to exemplify the power of personal sharing. While I was away from home for two weeks, uh, some folks online began to scheme. 
And all of a sudden my wife sent me pictures of packages that were coming in the mail. I had no idea what they were. Um, after the end of the two weeks I was presenting in Wisconsin and I was handed a pair of socks. And at that point uh, the light bulb came on and I, when I came home uh, I opened up 86 pairs of socks from uh, people all around the world. The things that start some of these stories are so small, like you would never even notice them. Sandy Brown Jensen, fellow digital storyteller, artist, writer, just creative persona, shares this one of how a photo she shared in Flickr was found by someone and used in a literary journal. But, as a good story goes, there's an added twist. I went to her URL and it turned out that she and I lived in the same neighborhood, unbeknownst to either of us, and I am now the uh, uh, contr uh, contributing artist to that literary journal, and I met everybody who contributes yesterday at a picnic in the local park. During a road trip across Canada in 2011, I got a chance to meet Andy McKeel, and this is one of those examples where you find someone in education, technology, who has a rather interesting thing that they are passionate about outside of this role. And for Andy, it has to do with wood. I took a picture of this Arbutus tree. And these Arbutus trees are amazing because they shed their bark and they're just a fascinating tree. And Alan saw this picture that I shared on Instagram and said, hey, you know, that looks a lot like these manzanita trees that we have down in Arizona where I live. And we just got dialoguing back and forth. And sure enough, about a month later, this piece of manzanita appears on my doorstep. So what do I do with this piece of wood that Alan shipped me from the desert? Well, I turned it into pens, of course, and I mailed a few back down to Arizona. I actually started turning bowls and all kinds of other things out of this piece of wood. There's another twist to the story. I was talking about Andy and also another educator friend, Di, who did something similar with some wood I sent from Arizona. I was telling this to Howard Rheingold, who was interviewing me, and Howard got so interested, he went out and started getting into wood turning and making pens. Most of my work has been in higher education, but connections in the way the world works now doesn't limit us now to those boxes. So it's been great that I've gotten to meet great educators like Heather Dernan and her colleague Clarence Fisher in Manitoba, who do this collaboration between their middle school students. And so Heather got interested in some of the stuff some colleagues and I were doing in DS-106 with a digital radio station, an internet radio station. And she got interested, and some people who helped build the DS-106 radio station helped Heather and Clarence set up one called 105 The Hive, and it's just blossomed into this great thing. And what was really cool about that first broadcast was that the grandparents of one of the students was tuning in from thousands of miles away in Hawaii. So this is an example of where people that I've actually never met face-to-face -face, um, were very generous in terms of helping us get this radio station up and running. It's now being used by many teachers across Canada and it's a free um, radio station that any um, K-12 teacher can use with their students. Teresa McKinnon shares a great story that started of all place in a comment on a Steve Wilber blog post in 2011 where she first met Simon Enser. They both teach foreign languages in different country and this chance meeting sparked a discussion that led them to develop Clavier, Connected Learning and Virtual Interculture Exchange Research Network, in which they've had thousands of students connect and learn from each other in their study of foreign language. It started really simple with a comment. <laughs> I don't even know Andy Mead. I think he got word of my project uh, through someone else in my network. But here's an example of how simple it is to tell a story. Get in your car and just say. So Andy talks about how I met someone special through Twitter changed his life. All of a sudden we started chatting through Twitter, uh, we followed each other on Instagram, she mocked me on in this Instagram because I only took pictures of my dogs. Um, I'm much more diverse, diversified now because of her. All of a sudden, three years later, we're married, we have a beautiful nine month old baby, um, we've got a perfect life. And a story from another educator new to me, Kathy Hone. Very typical story, it's still always good to hear. Teaching students a book, they're tweeting about it and sharing their artwork on Twitter. The author responds, connection made, kids go crazy. This stuff is easy. It happens a lot if you put it out there.
when I think about openness, I think a lot about the question, well, what are you open to? And that's why I want to tell you about the time I met Brian Alexander. Joe's great tale was of going to a conference and happening to find out he was on the plane with a colleague he knew but maybe didn't know so well. In fact, Brian Alexander was sitting in the seat behind Joe. Joe was traveling with his wife and his young son, maybe his son's first time on an airplane. The kid's excited. He's standing up. He's looking around, making big eyes at Brian. And Joe knows that Brian's important. He's probably working on papers or his presentation. And he talks about how Brian just like didn't take this child as a nuisance. And in fact, smiled at him, made a connection. This has nothing to do with technology or education. This has to do with being people. And I've profited a lot from Brian's skills and knowledge and his professional contacts but mostly I've benefited from contact with Brian, uh, that he is someone who is open to chances to be kind. I could do a whole presentation about stories about Mariana Funes, an educator from the UK that I got to know through DS-106, the digital storytelling course. She took over the operation of the DS-106 Daily Create, every day publishing a new creative challenge for other people to do. And sometimes as she talks about it, it's hard to come up with something. And so you find something small. And so an unexpected thing happened because she had the idea to ask people to take a photograph of a door. Doors. And I was not prepared for what I found on the stream that morning. Doors, doors, doors. And not all from people who usually participate in the S106. It turns out that Francesca loves doors. And she flooded the hashtag with beautiful photos. She chatted with a friend about her daily create find. And the friend loved doors too. I spoke to them about the S106, but they wanted to talk doors. Somebody else joined. And then somebody else. Somebody sent in a Pinterest board with more door photos than I could count. A friend of mine sent in a set of door photos from a lovely Italian town. Francesca, joined by Daisy, Francis, Janet, Elodie, Sandy, Alan, Bill. <laughs> the Door Addicts Club had emerged. We had found each other from all over the world through a love for door photography and open sharing. It turns out it is a thing and that doors seem to be a kind of material metaphor for boundaries and transition in our lives. I was so pleased to see a story come in from Claudia Lamoro. See, my main knowing of her was around 2006, 2007, in Second Life. Don't laugh. It was an amazing time back then, you and your hindsight. Anyhow, Claudia's story is really important because it talks about the fact that it just doesn't mean putting things out there and letting them happen. You have a play in this. So in her story, she talks about how she's very attentive to her connections on LinkedIn she seeks out people and interesting and proactively seeks to connect people. And that was how she tells the story of how she met Barry Gelston. Started with a connection in LinkedIn, then they decided to have a Skype conversation. I remember meeting a kindred spirit that day. At the end of that call, we scheduled another talk a month later. Then our conversation went dormant. Could have been another end of story. I was coming up on the one-year anniversary of my mother's death. Claudia continues to tell the chronology that led to a beautiful collaboration that's ongoing and regular today between her and Barry, all happening because they both made an effort to sort of keep this conversation going. There were so many points in her story where it could have dissolved and disaggregated into nothingness, but it didn't, and that's what makes it a beautiful story. My LinkedIn inbox shows a short message on April 22nd. Would you like to continue our conversation? And my reply, absolutely. Thanks so much for following up. Whenever telling my connected story, there's a part of me that always feels it's a little bit arbitrary where to start and where to begin. I think like most, my connected story started as a lurker, but unlike others, started in real life. I've never met Aaron Davis. Lives in Australia. We've interacted on Twitter, blog posts, etc. But I know him. And so his story is kind of a series of steps. It's not just one thing. 
It's kind of making connections offline, online, taking the risk to start new things, getting involved in Rizo 14, and then sort of moving out, actually establishing his own digital space on the web. And what he says, moving to self-determined learning. One of the most creative people I know on the internet is Kevin Hodgson. He's got his comics, he's got his music, he's got the teaching that he does. And here he talks about how people, different countries, different places, collaborated to build a poem together for no other reason that they thought it was an interesting idea. It kind of began when Ron began talking and sharing Wednesday. out a poem format the and piece. then like invited me and some others to contribute as well. And music. from there, the kind of idea of connections Wednesday. across Smack the world down, as poets toes and in, collaborators toes kind of really balance. came to be in a very interesting way that Wednesday. led to um, one Wednesday. single poem Cruising where eight of us were writing Smack. poetry every single day for Thursday. the course of the week and then anyway, pulling it all together as a collaborative audio poetry project. <laughs> Okay, how about a little bit of intermission? I will get back to the stories, don't worry. But I want to talk about something that comes up a lot when I do this. Uh, several rounds of soliciting these stories. You know, I publish blog posts. I put things out on Twitter. I email people. I sometimes am surprised at the difficulty some people have in responding to what I'm asking for. I think it's kind of simple. But, you know, sometimes your ideas that seem simple to you are complex to other people. It sometimes also gets frustrating, um, as you can see in this video. Hi there. My name is Feldspar. Yeah, I'm a stuffed animal. You can tell. But I live here in Strawberry, Arizona with Alan Levine. I'm a little bit concerned about him. He seems to be kind of frustrated oh, these days yeah. about people That's not you know, giving him stories. All I want is a video, not a blog post or some Google Hangout archive. Just the story. And why? I don't want retweets. Can't they just do a story? What am I doing wrong? So in general for these stories, I really do prefer a video. But it doesn't have to show your face. Like look at what Sandy Brown Jensen did. She talked and showed the scenes around the places where she lived. I think the human voice is important to these stories because it makes it that much more real. There's some detachment. I love words, but there's a detachment that words alone can have. We have to imagine so much more of the person. The human voice carries so much with it. But, you know, Kathy Doan, Teresa McKinnon, they shared great stories that were basically images and music. And you know what? I don't reject any of them. I have simple rules here. I love all the stories. It doesn't have to be fancy animation like you'll see that Amy Berval does. Really, all you need to do is sit down with your mobile phone, pick it up, take it out of your pocket. <laughs> I should have been ready. <laughs> you know, just say, hey, you know, hey, here's my story. And just tell it to the phone like you're talking the story. You won't believe this thing that just happened. I was so surprised. When, dot, 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 fill it in. So, you know, that's all I seek. Anything else you want to do, it's bonus. So, I don't have any rules. But you know what? People say, what do you want? What do you want out? What kind of story do you want? They kept asking me, what kind of story do you want? I want you to figure out what the story is. That surprise and excited you. It shouldn't be what I think it is. You know, in 2012, I did an online presentation for this, uh, for Alec Kuros and his uh, at MOOC uh, course. And I asked people in there, um, it was anonymous, to put on a shared whiteboard the things that they thought made it hard to share. I was really surprised. Nearly every response that I saw written there reflected questioning of people's own importance, self-worth. They would compare themselves to others. Oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not as good as Alec. Or just how it might look to share something that's not professional or might affect their reputation. So I really want to thank Darren Kurapatwa for turning me on to this video by Derek Sievers that really puts it well as to what we think is ordinary and what we think is amazing. I get this feeling often. Amazing books, music, movies, or even amazing conversations. I'm in awe at how the creator thinks like that. I'm humbled. But I continue to do my work. I tell my little tales. I share my point of view. 
Nothing spectacular, just my ordinary thoughts. So one day someone emailed me and said, I never would have thought about that. How did you even come up with that? It's genius. <laughs> of course, I disagreed, and I explained why it was nothing special. But afterwards, I realized something surprisingly profound. Everybody's ideas seem obvious to them. I'll bet even John Coltrane or Richard Feynman felt that everything they were playing or saying was pretty obvious. So maybe what's obvious to me is amazing to someone else. Hit songwriters in interviews often admit that their most successful hit song was one they just thought was stupid and not even worth recording. We're clearly a bad judge of our own creations. We should just put it out and let the world decide. Okay, hopefully that message means something to you. Sure did to me. But back to the stories. Amy Burva, an amazing creative force. Amazing. I gotta stop saying amazing, but Amy's amazing. And just black, pink, and white. What she draws and what she shares. She ain't just giving me one story. She gave me ten. Ten stories. And they're all they're all worth listening to. But a lot of what Amy does in these stories is talk about, again, how she actively puts out messages, asks people to get involved in her projects, and when she was a teacher with her students. And so I'm just gonna put one story in here of how Amy was teaching her students and they were listening to TED Talks. And her practice of having her students do back channel conversations about the speakers during these videos. And what happens? Because the speakers sometimes listen and talk back. Again, it changes everything for these students to be heard. And it's pretty darn simple. Here, let Amy tell us about it. And the cool part was we would find out what the Twitter handles were of the speakers. And a couple of times, the speakers would actually write us back as we were watching. And this blew my students' minds away. Um, Dan, uh, Doug Rushkoff wrote us, I know, and John Ronson, who was brilliant and did one of my favorite TED Talks about uh, strange answers to the psychopath test. Um, he was kind enough to write my students as well. And it just it, it just brought a whole new level. I mean, it completely changed their view of, of what school could be. Ken Bauer, originally from Canada, but being a teacher in Mexico for the last 20 years, tells some great stories about both the influence of people suggesting him to try new things, and also what happens when he takes that as a leverage to go out and create connections with other people. Later that same year, I ran into John Bergman, uh, one of the pioneers in flip learning at our main campus in Monterey, had a great talk with him, and he said, Ken, you know, you, you, you can need to, like, stir up flip learning here in Mexico. So, so I thought, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll create a private Facebook group and, and, and for our people here at the tech. And he said, no, 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 you got to be public. you got to open this up to everyone. And you need to be the leader in, in, in Mexico for flip learning. So, And you know what? One thing leads to another, like a chain reaction. Ken gets involved in flip learning. He goes to conference. He meets a teacher educator named Brian Bennett. Brian Bennett's involved in DS-106. Ken gets involved in DS-106, meets Jim Groon and myself and Brian Lamb. We start collaborating together, building connected courses together. All of a sudden, Ken is part of this pro great project that we're working on in Mexico at the University of Guadalajara. One thing leads to another if you put something into it. Laura Ritchie's a music teacher in the south part of the UK. She's a accomplished uh, performing cellist. She gets interested in connected learning. She becomes part of connected courses going on. She's in a hangout with Gardner Campbell. He asked her to play the cello live. She's a performer. She's practiced. She doesn't always do live. She does it anyhow. She takes chances. She extends. She does a project where she has her students raise money and come to the U.S. to meet other student musicians that they become connected with. She decides to come to Arizona and visit me. We want to play music together. I'm a terrible guitar player. And here we are down in Tucson at the Mission San Javier playing music and sharing together. Me teaching her? That's crazy. And I did one of those things that, that I certainly wouldn't have done even at the time of the webinar. And, uh, and we played things. We just played things. And it was really fun. And he became my teacher. August. When does he come in? All right. Yeah. Okay. And then what? Meet 
meet Simon Enser, originally from the UK, living and teaching language in France. Got to know him through uh, connected courses and some of RISO 15, 14, whatever. Simon's a really thoughtful guy, and he kind of sometimes turns issues inside out. Connectivity is good, but in this story, he talks about his day of somewhat being frustrated about the wireless at school and some things going on, but then talking to people he works and teaches with in Haiti and dealing with situations in Nepal and sort of realizing in perspective um, his stories of connections and what it means for people sometimes who deal a lot more with disconnections. And I suddenly felt completely and utterly disconnected, overawed, useless, helpless. And I thought to myself, well, you know, what is the point of being a connected educator if you can only connect with people who share the same, same privileges? So this is a story, I suppose, of connection because I would never have been able to tell the story if I had not been connected to uh, the guy in Haiti. I'm telling the story the, the, the very day that this has happened. I couldn't have had uh, an understanding of those difficulties if I hadn't had those long conversations that I'd had with my friends, uh, Blaise, for example. I couldn't have had the, the understanding, the limited understanding that I have of of what was going on if I hadn't seen the photos of school building projects and, and uh, Sebastian, the, the guys who work in Haiti. But I'm left with that feeling of helplessness and, and sometimes I feel almost it's, it's perverse. It's a perverse, vicarious spectator, spectator sport being a connected educator. So there is hope. There is hope in all that. David Carnahan from uh, the UK. He's a good friend I got to know through DS106. Fantastic musician. In fact, he recorded for me the original music that you hear on the intro and some of the breaks for this video. He just gave me a song because I asked for one. And he's freaking talented with the guitar and other instruments. But his story, and I didn't want stories about me, but he did it anyhow. He's talking about his work for JISC, which is really an important organization in the UK for higher education and technology. How often they have to pay money to license images for their publications. Now, he was doing a work on another colleague, uh, Jonathan Worth, and he decided to look and flicker and found some images I took of Jonathan, you know, a photographer taking a picture of a photographer, that David found useful, openly licensed Creative Commons that they made of use for this report they had to publish. Pretty simple story, ends well. There are loads and loads of pictures of Jonathan with a camera, so I thought I could just use one of them. And it was openly licensed, and it had a great picture of the guy who'd actually, who the report was actually about. And that became the front cover of the report, and everyone loved it. And we also used it in the blog post for that report. And I've introduced a whole bunch of other people to looking in Alan's Flickr collection for if they're doing anything that uh, needs an image for JISC. Alison Endress gave this great story, which appropriately opened with her and her dog Elroy. It wasn't about Elroy. But again, story of perhaps unlikely series of circumstances. She is a grad student uh, working in higher education. Um, sees a tweet about someone writing an article about issues of being an adjunct. She has that experience. She reaches out to this person and offers some suggestions. He ends up interviewing her, featuring her in a story that appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Now, the thing that happened was for the publication, they asked her for a photo of herself. And so they asked for three so, so they could choose. And she sent a couple professional ones. But the third one, almost on a whim, she sent a picture of her with a backpack coming off of a trip uh, that she took up in the Northwest. And that was the one that they went with. So this picture goes out, and it's a picture of her, as she says, I haven't showered for three days, etc. But there it goes out in the Chronicle. She gets a lot of feedback, positive from that article. Things happen. Someone invites her to be part of an event through the pod network. And they start talking. And Allison starts to wonder, you know, why did you pick me? It has to do with that photo. 
And she said, you know, um, I read your story on Vitae and I worked as an Outward Bound instructor for um, several years and I just really loved that you had a backpacking picture and that I thought we'd have a lot in common. Pedagogically, professionally, you're somebody that I think I'd like to have a beer with. Like it, it was that, it was that kind of thing, right? And so uh, we had a lovely conversation about where she worked. The next thing you know, we're talking about hiking and topo maps and gear and uh, um, suddenly I'm off the phone with this woman realizing that I really didn't get much information about the actual gig that I had said to, but I knew that I had a new friend in Asheville, North Carolina. Hi, I am Brian Metcalf and I live in the center of Canada. My true story of amazing connections shares how I was solicited from a far off continent to send money to help out an individual whom I had never met. As you know, con artists and scammers will go to extreme lengths to harm seniors. And I am a senior citizen. People ask me what kind of stories that I like to get. I can only dream of getting more stories like this one I say for last from Brian Metcalf. He gets you with a hook. He plays with it. He uses, like, real-world situations. He doesn't give away the story from the beginning. And I really shouldn't tell the story because Brian tells it so well. But I did get to know Brian through DS106. He came in, retired teacher. He was blogging already. But Brian took on DS106 and creativity with a voraciousness and a detail for sharing how and why he did things. That was a beautiful example for my students. Anyhow... In his stories, it doesn't have to do with me, thankfully, but he does meet through DS106 another fellow student named Jess McCall, who happens to live in Australia. Jess has this dream of going to this event in Canada called Unplugged. I got to go too and meet Jess, but that's not the story. To fund the trip, Jess came up with this idea, she's amazingly creative, that she would do a poem for anybody who helped support her trip to the U.S., she would write an original poem and perform it for them. And Brian asked her to do a poem on uh, the power of sharing. And it's a beautiful thing. And you just have to listen to Brian's whole video. Sorry, I am not doing it justice. Stop this video or go later. Go to my story site and watch Brian Metcalf's story. You won't be sorry. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, if you're still there, for staying with this video for so long. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed putting it together. Uh, I hope you really go to the site and check out the stories. There's the URL right down there. Um, but more than that, I really hope you give me a story. There's a form on there, um, and I'll put that link too, where you can go to. And all you have to do is, is tell me you know, a little bit about the story. Send me a link. Publish it to YouTube or Vimeo. Just do it really quick. But right after the conference or during the conference, I bet something is happening that will surprise you as far as who you met or what kind of connections you're able to meet just through the act of being part of the K-12 online conference or stuff you're doing ordinary otherwise. And I'm just going to close with some little excerpts that I pulled, uh, messages from a video where they're telling you the message, not me. Thanks again, and I hope you have some stories to share. There is nothing life-changing about this little story. It was just lovely to see so many beautiful photos openly shared. And I think it, it really continues to impress upon me how important it is that we connect on these very human, personal levels. And even if they're sort of born out of these rather silly ways, I think there's still something really powerful about connecting with other human beings uh, in this really, really interesting way. What this taught my students was the power of their words and the power of being connected. In over a year, I'd say in 15 months, that one random tweet and that one email has really opened doors for me and quite literally changed my life. And that basically means education rhymes with hope. And I think that if I have any message at all is that hope goes from Haiti to France and back to you. So yeah, there are issues of disconnection, but what can we do apart from connect those little instances or glimpses uh, 
of hope. And that's kind of how connectedness works. Um, sometimes the people that you really need are the people across two oceans or the people across the ether, not necessarily the people living in your same geographical vicinity. And I really appreciate that. And that's what connectedness means to me. So I suspect Alan's probably saved us over the years quite a lot of money. He's made our stuff look better. And he doesn't even know he's done this. He's just made this as... He's just been making pictures because he loves to make pictures. And we've been able to benefit for that. Kathleen's now a dear friend. I, and I owe it all to some random encounter on the internet. The web allows a lot of possibilities. It's so easy to get caught in the trap of thinking that every journey is the same. But it never is. Everyone has their own story and it's never quite complete. A lot of times we, we need to just get out there and share our stories and follow people and say, hey, I like what you're doing. And they can come and see what we're doing and say, hey, you know, I would like to, to implement what you're doing. Can you help me out? In summary, I would suggest that this amazing story of connection might be considered the ultimate con job as it starts with a Canadian conference and involves much connecting with other online learners where Jess McCulloch conceives of an idea to raise travel funds. She needs to convince contributors and promises to construct poems. Lastly, I can say I'm so pleased with this endeavor. In fact, as an investor, you might say that I am indeed quite content. Take care. I hear so many people devalue online connections. It's important to remember that those are living, breathing people behind those Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn names, reaching for connection each in their own way. It's about what we do with those connections. You need a little bit of luck, good timing, serendipity, chemistry, and if you do feel a spark of possibility, lots of persistence and showing up. It's about risking to say what you think and being generous and kind, giving each other the benefit of the doubt, showing appreciation, not taking understanding for granted, continually opening your mind. Building trust takes time, so you need patience. And it's just unbelievable how one tweet of a Vine video got us connected and through Instagram and Twitter just more connection and all of a sudden uh, life's pretty awesome. But I just think it's pretty amazing just to see what can happen when you share some of the things you're doing in such public spaces. It made me wonder if Sherry Turkle is right when she says we are so desperate for connection without commitment that we get excited about connecting through any content ephemerally. But maybe, just maybe, the, jo the joy that we feel in the open web is about finding our common humanity and feeling grateful just for that. And I think we could do really well to think about the ways that openness and kindness can be related if we let them. like Amy Baral does with animation, etc. Just prop up your mobile phone and press record. Take like three or four minutes. Talk like you're talking to a friend. Like, you wouldn't believe this thing that happened to me. I was online, I was researching this, and I came across this person, and next thing I knew, that's all you need to do is express the excitement of making that connection in your own voice. Best thing, just say it right to the camera. And I just did one take. Three minute video, upload to YouTube, fill out the form. I was done. I was outside playing in 10 minutes. And then this is the kind of sound that I will hear. 
can go for it. I got five more stories in just the last hour. I can't wait to edit these and put them online and share them at the K12 online conference. So I think you know what to do now. Can you help out? And then just submit your story at the URL below. Thank you.